I have the luxury of, of both doing an introduction here and uh, having the first presentation. So uh, if we can put up my slides for, for my, uh, my presentation. What's the future of, of, uh, of the Internet of Things? First thing up, I think I need to, to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about who we are and what we do. So um, as an analyst, I, I suspect you're, you're expecting me to uh, put up a bunch of slides outlining the, uh, the many billions of connections or trillions of revenue that, uh, that are going to be coming through. Um, so we do have that. That's, that's part of what we do. Um, but I'm going to be de dealing with some other issues within, within the context of, of, of M2M at the moment. So a few words about who we are and what we do. Uh, some of our clients, we, we deal with uh, a whole host of, of companies across the, uh, across the M2M ecosystem, from uh, network operators to equipment vendors to, to end users. And the research that we do falls into broadly two categories. So one is we're looking at the, at the demand side, looking at vertical sectors, the opportunities within automotive, healthcare, utilities, and, and, and so forth. Building forecasts and, and, and looking at some of the, the key, uh, key drivers and barriers in, in those vertical sectors. The other element is we look at the, uh, the supply side. So effectively looking at all of those horizontal issues that are, that are affecting the, the M2M and IoT uh, ecosystem, things like security. Uh, things like uh, software platforms, things like big data strategies, some of which I'll be, I'll be talking about a little bit today. And we support that through, through our advisory service and through, through custom research. So that's very quickly about who we are and, and, and what we do. Um, when we think about that, that horizontal uh, research around the, uh, the, the whole value chain across M2M and IoT, Really, there's, there's a whole lot of disruption going on uh, across modules and devices, networks, uh, network operators, and, and even on the, the end user side. So a whole host of disruptions. Some of those issues we'll be, we'll be dealing with today. So very, very, that's a very quick, uh, quick introduction. So um, the real focus, I think, of the, of the presentation today, though, is around the, um, not so much around how we connect things, but more around um, the way in which those devices are connected. So when we're talking about M2M, what we tend to talk about is the numbers of devices, the, the, the amount of traffic, the amount of revenue generated. But as it's an IoT event, what I wanted to talk about was, was some of the issues around how that connectivity is provided and the, and the overall ecosystem that, that is, that's created. Now, in the, uh, as the name would suggest, the IoT is, is more about openness. It's about a nurturing environment for, for application developers, and it's about stitching together connected devices with a whole range of other inputs, be it, uh, be it data sets, be it um, business processes, and a whole other range of, uh, of elements. So really, my presentation is now going to fall into, into three parts, which you can see on here. So um, the first relates, well, the first two really relate to some of the critical ways uh, that we see the Internet of Things evolving from what was previously thought of as, as machine to machine. And specifically, that is around uh, uh, the new platform architecture that we, we need to deal with those demands. And it's around the, uh, the requirement to analyze and act on data that, uh, that, that's created, particularly in, in terms of real-time analysis and, and, and action. So that's the, the, the next two areas. And then finally, uh, I'll go on to offer some thoughts on how the IoT is likely to evolve with the aid of of a few friends. Now, um, no coincidence, though, those first two areas on application platforms and, and big data analytics uh, are areas that we've published white papers on recently, free white papers available on our website. So I would encourage you to go and, uh, and, and download those and, and read them, because I'll be, I'll be rattling through some of this in, in, in fairly short order. So um, if, you, uh, if you want to know more, then, then either talk to me or, uh, or take a look at those, uh, the, those white papers. So. Onto the uh, the first area, so around M2M and IoT platform evolution. Um, they say never start with a with an apology, but um, but I'll start with a couple. So, first apology is that I am going to be going through this quite quickly. Second apology is that um, the uh, I will start with a fairly simplistic approach and, and and talk you through that. But I think sometimes it's good to go back to uh, to first principles. So, let me take you back in in, in the dark dim and distant past of machine-to-machine uh, -machine with the first M2M applications. Now, in those, in those instances, what we, what we had was um, a, 
a requirement for anybody who wanted to implement a, a, an M2M solution of needing to um, stitch together a whole host of different elements into the, uh, into the M2M uh, application. So that would include the device functionality, the, the application environment, the application logic, and a whole host of other different things. This is a complicated and, 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 and quite a difficult uh, thing to, to stitch together. What happened then was we entered the world of the platform. Um, and when we talk about platforms, we're talking about a, a whole range of different platforms from the connectivity support platform, the device management, service enablement, uh, a, a vast array provided by a, a range of different companies. Now, this provided some standardized building blocks that allowed for the, for the development of M2M applications. Um, they tended to focus on uh, specific areas, as I mentioned, like device management or, or connectivity support, um, although there are a, a range of vendor solutions that, that, that cut across a range of those. The point is, though, that the, uh, these building blocks drove out a lot of the, the complexity uh, that existed in deploying a, an M2M service. Um, now, that worked up to a point. Okay, So that allowed us to get to the point that we are today, providing um, uh, cheap uh, and, and readily um, deployable M2M solutions. Now, what we're advocating going forward is that, uh, that this application environment, actually, can you go back? There we go. That this application environment will, um, will evolve. So uh, it's um, uh, the, um, sorry, just one moment. Um, so initially, we started with a host of, of device-centric um, applications that have, have done little but report on, on the, um, sorry, I'm having a few problems with the slides. No, back, of, back, please. And again, please. There we go. So, sorry about that. Um, so, we started initially, as I was saying, with a, with a host of device-centric uh, applications that might have done little but report information or offered some element of, of control of that application. And that's what's presented in the first four uh, points on the, on, on the chart there. What we've seen then is, a, is an evolution to what we term a, a process-centric M2M, uh, whereby the connection of the device was, was effectively integrated with a, with a service. And, and this has massively enriched that, that, that M2M uh, experience. Now, the process, range of different processes, that, uh, to give a few examples on maybe the automotive sector, something like usage-based insurance, stitching in uh, risk management, risk profiling of, of drivers into, a, into an application uh, and, and into the connectivity. Or it could be something like, something more advanced, like a shared car ownership scheme. So uh, what we're seeing is a, is a sh what we've seen is a shift from this device-centric M2M, which is about connectivity, into a process-centric M2M, which is looking at uh, the uh, integrating M2M into that, uh, into that wider uh, application. Next step on from this is to move to um, more of an Internet of Things approach, as, as, as highlighted in, in, in point number eight. So there, all of these diverse sources of data, including from the connected device, are made available for, potentially for third-party application uh, developers. And effectively, what we see there is a disaggregating of the device from the application to, to create more of what we would term uh, a, a, an Internet of Things. Now, in this scenario, what we need to see is an evolution from that uh, platform approach that we've seen uh, historically to a new platform approach. So what's required uh, in this new world of Internet of Things is for all of those platforms to be abstracted. Okay. So effectively, being able to draw information out of all of those, th those various different platforms uh, into what we are terming an M2M IoT application platform, which will then allow uh, third-party application developers to, to, to come in and build applications on those, uh, on those platforms. So that's, that, we think, is a, is a, is a fundamental shift in how, how the business works. And, and that's something that we're expecting to see over the, over the next couple of years. And here we've got, we present what are some of the, the key elements of functionality in, in, uh, in what is that, uh, that M2M IoT application platform. So it's about, uh, in the application development side, it's about quick and efficient development tools for applications and intelligent business rules and processes and complex device groupings. Um, in terms of application management, it's about 
greater focus on being able to manage firmware and software updates. Uh, in terms of scalability, it, it needs to be massively scalable, more so than, than we've probably seen in, in, in the past. In terms of, um, well, there, there's a whole range of, of elements, so um, I probably don't have time to go through, through all of these today, but just to say that there's, there's, a, there's a whole host of different features and functions that these M2M and IoT application platforms will, will, will need to have uh, in order to, um, to, to, be, uh, to be effective. And there are a range of companies who are, who are looking at developing th those. And there are, as I mentioned, hosts of companies that are, that are looking at developing those, just a few of whom are, are presented on this, this slide here. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to talk about in this, in this context is um, another way of thinking about this evolution from, uh, from, the, uh, from M2M to IoT. So effectively what we had with, with machine to machine was a set of intranets of things whereby the, the, the data management and, and, um, and application uh, logic would be handled via uh, within a, a relatively closed, uh, closed group, uh, typically within, a, within an individual uh, company. And the devices that were deployed were focused on a particular solution. Gradually, we're, we're seeing an evolution of this to go through something that we're terming the subnet of things. Now, uh, as a bit of an aside, we were trying to come up, we were thinking about acronyms for this, and subnet of things as SNOT didn't really seem necessarily to be the best one, but um, we'll, we'll give that some further thought. Um, but this, these subnets of things will catalyze around particular companies or particular, particular groupings and, and, and organizations or maybe around geographical areas, around, around cities perhaps. And they will allow for the data sharing within those groups. And that's where a whole host of the value associated with data sharing actually lies because uh, if you think of something like healthcare, maybe uh, an, an organization such as, uh, as Tunet, Within healthcare, data sharing actually provides a, a huge amount of, of, of benefit in terms of stitching together maybe your, your physician with uh, healthcare monitoring devices that you have, with hospitals, with a, with a range of other, other groupings. Um, that might not necessarily so much be the case when it comes to stitching together the whole of the Internet of Things, because does your uh, heart rate monitor need to be able to communicate with a set of traffic lights? pretty unlikely that, that that situation will arise. Therefore, we see most of the value within, within IoT is actually, actually developing initially out of these subnets of, subnets of things. Um, we can't talk about M2M or IoT these days without, uh, without talking about big data analytics, so, uh, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, as I outlined in some of the previous slides, the, uh, the evolution from this device-centric to the process-centric uh, applications is a very real, um, real development that we're, that we're seeing at the moment. Now, with this evolution comes an added requirement to make use of um, data in a variety of ways. So, um, initially we saw just basic data, transmission of, of data um, in that uh, device-centric world. And as we evolve, we get to see much more of a, of a contextualization of that data. Uh, then we see more actioning of that data, much more actionable data. Um, and then eventually we get on to what we would term uh, automating, that, that, uh, automating operations based, based on that data. So um, what we're seeing is a much more um, uh, sophisticated requirement for, for data analytics and, and management as we evolve uh, M2M into the, into the Internet of Things. Um, and often that will need to take place in, in, in real time with real time uh, actioning of that, of that data. Now, um, this is all, of course, notwithstanding the, uh, the use of the um, uh, exhaust data that, that comes through from all of these M2M devices. That's, that's also a separate matter, also very valuable. But what we, what we think is the, is the most interesting area is around the, the, the real-time um, actioning of this data. So in order to uh, be able to understand the data that, that, that we're managing in, in, an, in an M2M and IoT context, we really need to um, think about how we how we define and, and, um, and, and measure this, uh, this data. So we've got a, a five-way split in terms of the, the, the characteristics of uh, this big data and, and how you would think about it. So that's in terms of size, in terms of speed, in terms of situation, 
and in terms of significance. So size being the amount of data, uh, the speed being the, the rate at which it's delivered and, and consumed, uh, situation being the context in which that data is created and managed, and structure being uh, the fact that there are all sorts of varying different types of, of, of data um, from, from very structured all the way through to, to incredibly unstructured data. But the, the, the most critical element is around the, uh, the, the significance of the, the, the data. So it's about contextualizing that data and, and, and um, being able to determine a significance. And the reason why, why that's important is that um, you need to understand the significance of data in order to be able to prioritize, in order to act on it, in order to, to determine what's the most important data to be, to be uh, transporting and, and, and how you would, you would do that. So we've come up with a... Um, a way of quantifying that, uh, that, that significance of data, or, or at least a framework for, for, for doing so. Um, so we call this the data significance uh, factor, and it's a function of the, the priority, uh, the impact, and the predictability of that data. So at the lowest of these DSFs, the uh, data significance factor, what you have effectively is um, very predictable traffic, that's probably only going to be analyzed in terms of long-term market trends. Whereas at the highest end of the, of the DSF, at the bottom, DSF 5, what you have is um, much more unpredictable data, much more mission-critical data that needs to be acted on immediately. So a, a good example of this might be uh, emergency call uh, data for, for the e-call uh, solution that's being deployed in Europe or, and, and similar uh, solutions being, being deployed in various other pl places around the world. So, um, as I said, this uh, understanding the significance of the data uh, could potentially have some implications for how valuable that data is and how you might want to uh, transport it or, or, um, or, or manage it. Um, I won't talk in too much detail about this slide. So this is, this is just reinforcing that um, there are a number of factors that are driving the growth in, in M2M and, and, and driving the growth in, in big data. Um, I've talked at length of various other points about, about um, new technology on the, on the M2M side, connectivity and, and so forth. But worth noting that on the data side, there's also similarly a whole host of, of, uh, of factors that are, that are driving the ability to manage and, and, and control data through uh, cheaper data storage and, and processing, uh, and, and a variety of other things that we, that we mention on, on, on here. And what we, what we then thought would be interesting to do would be to take our forecasts of uh, M2M connectivity uh, and uh, usage in terms of the, the wide variety of M2M applications that, that are out there, and look at the, um, the significance of the data that's, that's being created. So um, what we've got on this chart is, is on the, um, the y-axis, the significance of the data, and on the x-axis, the volume of the data. So a, a host of, of different um, uh, applications presented on there. Um, now, the... So there's, there's a few interesting ones. So uh, things around uh, CCTV, very high volumes of data, very significant. Telemedicine, again, presents a, a, an application that, that has very, uh, very large amounts of data, potentially, with, with, with high significance. Other significant ones, I mentioned e-call. Uh, anything around healthcare, I think, is, is inevitably going to be a, a, a critical one. Um, whereas you have also a lot, of, a lot of applications where the data perhaps isn't so significant, uh, so smart metering, uh, digital signage, a whole host of different, different applications around there. So there is a, a very uh, real uh, variation uh, within the context of what we talk of as M2M and IoT in terms of, of the significance of these, uh, the, the, these sets, of, uh, sets of data. And I'll skip on past that one because we've talked about that one already. Um, so that was just a couple of areas where we see there being some critical uh, developments going on in the, uh, in the M2M and IoT space. Now I want to run very quickly through some, uh, some thoughts on M2M and IoT uh, evolution scenarios um, with a few, hopefully, thought-provoking ideas uh, about how uh, the industry is likely to develop. And, uh, and I would hope that during the course of today, 
Um, some of these will resonate with some of the other presentations that are coming on, and uh, maybe some of the other speakers will, will challenge me on some of these thoughts or, 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 or hopefully a, a agree. So, um, and I'm going to do it with the aid of one or two, one or two so we say friends, more or less. Um, so, th the first one is a quote from William Gibson. William Gibson is, a, is an author who wrote uh, Neuromancer, and he's also the guy who came up with the, uh, the, the expression cyberspace. So, a guy knows a thing or two about, about technology. And he said, the future's already here, it's just not very evenly di distributed. So, um, and th this is kind of the way that we think, think about M2M and IoT, maybe for the next year or two. Um, there are tens of millions of connections, possibly hundreds of millions of connections, depending on, on, on what your categorization is of, of, of M2M and IoT. However, we're looking at evolving to, to billions of connections over the, the, the course of the next, uh, the next few years. And an awful lot of that will be around um, the same applications, just more of them. So if you think about connected cars, there are currently... Uh, a few tens of millions of, of, of connected cars, and we're looking at getting to hundreds of millions, potentially billions of, of connections in the, in the connected car space. If you think about the, the connected home, there might be quite a number of you as, a, as very tech-savvy people who have got connected homes with connected light switches and, and, um, and, and security systems and so forth. That's definitely not the norm at the moment, though. So we will see a, a, an increasing adoption of, of, of those, um, the, those applications and services. So these islands of, of M2M or IoT or however you want to characterize it will evolve to, to, um, to, to cover much more of the, um, of the world. Um, another example might be connected parking, where you see um, certain schemes. I'm, I'm based in San Francisco at the moment. There's a, a scheme called SF Park there, which will uh, tell uh, drivers where, where parking spaces are. Um, that's quite unusual. You don't see that in many cities, but it is coming to a city near you uh, very soon. London, as I understand it, has just uh, announced a plan to, to deploy this. So, again, the implication from, from what Gibson said is the same but more, and we, we tend to think that, that that's certainly the case. But there is a contrasting view. Okay, so uh, Andrew uh, McAfee is a uh, lecturer at MIT. And uh, I saw him present uh, a few months ago talking about uh, what he termed the second half of the, of the chessboard. Now, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with the, uh, with, with the old uh, parable about um, uh, the Indian or Chinese or, or, or wherever emperor, depending on who you, uh, who you listen to. Uh, where the story comes from, who um, offered a prize to somebody, some say the inventor of chess, whereby, uh, and, and, the, and the, uh, the, the prize winner said that for his prize he wanted uh, one grain of rice put on the first uh, uh, square of a chessboard, two on the second, four on the third, eight on the, on the fourth, and so forth. And as it turned out, uh, going through all those 64 squares, he bankrupted the, uh, the, the emperor. Now, it's interesting to note that in that, uh, that uh, the first half of the chessboard certainly would have put a sizable dent into the, uh, into the grain silos or the rice silos of the, of the emperor, but it was really getting into the second half of the chessboard that it really made a, made a significant difference and effectively bankrupted the guy. Now, what uh, McAfee is, is uh, advocating is that technology is, is moving in, in much the same way. So you think about things like Moore's Law with, with the doubling of, of processing capacity and so forth. And effectively, as we get into the second half of the chessboard, which is, is, is what he believes based on, um, uh, on a number of different, uh, different measures, effectively what we're seeing is a transformational effect in how we think about, about technology. So potentially that, that uh, technology shift could be indescribably huge and have a, a, a massive and radical impact on, on, uh, on how life, uh, life on Earth works. Um, next on to dear old Donny Rumsfeld, who, uh, who found a very, very um, uh, bad way of saying something that actually makes Quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of sense talking about uh, known knowns, unknown unknowns, and, and known unknowns, and, and, and various other things along uh, uh, along those lines. And his 
point was quite a, quite a good one. Um, essentially, this is the case in, in, in the internet, internet of Things. Either we take the view that the world will evolve as, as, as Gibson suggests, and we, and we see um, uh, just more of the same, or we take a view that, that it's as, as McAfee suggests, which is um, a more radical change. Or, or, uh, now, and, and I think this is kind of summed up quite well in, in, in what, uh, what Rumsfeld was talking about. Obviously, he was talking about a completely different situation, but this, the, these scenarios about um, how we think about um, the, the, the varying different impacts on, on, uh, on M2M and IoT, I think, is still a relevant one. Now, and, and the point is, is I will... Um, illustrate my points by, by referring to, to, uh, to, to Charles Darwin. Um, all of this tends to favor a Darwinian approach. So um, really, it's about those who are the most flexible, given that we don't really necessarily know exactly what the, what the world is going to look like. Gibson might think we do. McAfee might think we, we, we don't. Given that there is a certain amount of uncertainty, really it's about the, uh, about the ability to be flexible and to collaborate that will allow uh, companies and organizations to, to, to prevail. This is particularly true in, in, in the Internet of Things, um, where it, maybe it's, it's about the, the end customer being able to, to, uh, to collaborate and, and evolve, but it's particularly about the companies that are supplying IoT and M2M space that need to facilitate that, that ability to, 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 uh, to collaborate and, and evolve. Um, in those first few, few quotes, what I, what I presented was what we would expect from IoT as, as it evolves, or rather maybe what we wouldn't expect. Um, there's also a number of areas where uh, there's some uncertainty and, and, and concern about, um, about how uh, the uh, M2M and IoT, some of the barriers and hurdles that the M2M and IoT space might, might, might face. One of the big ones is around privacy and, and, and security, uh, and that's an area that we've certainly been looking at a, a, an awful lot recently. Um, and the, the big challenge associated with this shift to IoT is that as you start to mash up a whole host of different data sets, what you need to be doing is putting in place frameworks for managing uh, a whole different set of, of data inputs where, with differing uh, sets of requirements for, for, for privacy and security. So there's issues around things like um, presumed consent for, for, for how data is used. Um, now... Uh, we've addressed this quite a lot in, in, in some of the things that we've published, but um, the, the thing that comes through most uh, prominently is that transparency is a, is, is a critical thing. If you tell people how you're going to use their data and they are clear on exactly what the, what the usage of that data is, uh, then there is a, there is a certain, more, certain amount more satisfaction and, 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 and comfort with, with how, uh, how that will play out. Um, and this is really illustrated by the, this quote from, uh, from Brandeis. Now, that's a, that's a massive simplification of the, of the issues associated with, uh, with security and privacy, um, but if you want to know more, then, then, then do come talk to me. A uh, couple of other very quick uh, points. Um, in terms of social and, and, um, and, and societal impact, um, this evolution to the M2M and, and, and IoT um, potentially offers a, a scenario where there's a lot more management and, and, and there's concern about a, a, a sort of a, a big brother state, and, and this is sort of... Um, summed up, I think, quite well with, um, with, with uh, a quote from Richard Brattigan, who was a, who was a poet who, who very much advocated uh, a cybernetic ecological utopia. I had to write that down. So um, uh, uh, Now, that might be a terrifying prospect, but if you believe what McAfee said, then we are evolving to something that could be a, a radical change. And how do we cope with this world where we are potentially all watched over by machines of loving grace? We'll, we'll see. And to give the other flip side, the, that might be the utopian view of it. Maybe the dystopian view of it is, is this one. Um, so this is from Terminator. Terminator 2, in fact, specifically. It becomes self-aware at 2.14 a.m. Eastern Time on August the 29th. That was 1997, in case you were, you were wondering. You might have, you might have missed that. Um, again, very much a dystopian view on, on, on how, uh, how all of these, these evolutions and changes might be, might be occurring. Last but not least... Uh, I'll leave you with a, with a, a quote from uh, of something that's maybe a, a bit more of a, a realistic uh, evolution that could have potentially a, a very uh, significant changing effect on, on, on how the, the world works. James Burke is a uh, science historian, uh, very eminent and, and, and very well respected. Um, and he recently ran through uh, some, 
some uh, predictions that he made in 1973 uh, about how the world would, uh, w- would evolve technologically. And actually, they were, they were pretty, um, pretty accurate. Uh, there's, a, there's a podcast out there uh, that was uh, done on the BBC. Uh, so I recommend checking that out. He, 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 um, he, he talks in, in quite some detail about those, those predictions, uh, one of, just one of which was how we're not going to be overly concerned about privacy in, the, uh, in, in 2013. And if you look at Facebook and, and, and so forth, maybe you would agree with that. Um, anyway, he made a, a number of predictions this year about how things will evolve. And the main one was around this, this concept of personal nanofactories, which would effectively allow people uh, to use um, nothing more than maybe some air, dirt, and acetylene gas, as he, as, as he described it, to create pretty much anything that they might want to, want to create. And he believes this is coming within the next 30 years and could have a fundamental impact on, on how, how society works. So, again, another... You might see that as a nightmare scenario. You might see that as a, as a, a liberating and, and, and wonderful scenario in which, which to, uh, to, to, to be. Um, so uh, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Um, hopefully, I've left you with some, some thoughts on some of the evolution areas around, around M2M and IoT that we see as important around platforms and around, around data analytics, and also maybe a few thought-provoking ideas from some of the uh, some eminent people in, in, in the area, or actually not within the area, but with some, some, uh, some quotes which I think are, are relevant in, in an M2M context. So, thank you.